all been engaged for most of the 20th century in a sort of war of religion. All of us. We didn't believe in raising tomorrows. If you believe you are living in a world which is crashing about your ears, your choice is a future or no future. I'm not the only person who ends the 20th century with the feeling that things could have been different and better. I think there are very few people who end the 20th century uh, not looking back with a certain amount of melancholy and forward with a certain amount of unease. Eric Hobsbawm is one of our most original historians. His trilogy on the 19th century Age of Revolution, Age of Capital, and Age of Empire, has been acclaimed as one of the great achievements of historical writing in recent decades. Together with fellow Marxists E.P. Thompson and Christopher Hill, Hobsbawm's work changed the way we think about British history. Now Eric Hobsbawm has turned for the first time to the 20th century in his new book, Age of Extremes, The Short 20th Century, published this week. This is a history Eric Hobsbawm has not only written about, but lived. He was born in 1917, the year of the Russian Revolution. He's a Jew who was forced to flee from Hitler's Germany. A communist through the Stalin years, he stayed in the party in 1956, and he lived to see 1989, and now, in the 1990s, he sees the threat of a return to barbarism. Eric, you've written important books about the history of the 19th century, about imperialism, about laboring men. What are the challenges of writing the history of your own century, the times you yourself have lived? Well, one thing that's difficult, to, makes it difficult to write contemporary history is that you need, it seems to me, a certain amount of distance. Emotional distance as well as chronological distance from it. Uh, it's possible to do this now, since the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, because you can look back and see the period from 1914 or thereabouts to 1989, 91, thereabouts, as something belonging together, as not simply a tract of time, but something which has its unity. What then is the shape of that, that period, the short century? I think the shape is, it begins with the breakdown of 19th century society. The breakdown, the reconstitution of capitalist society on a different basis. One of the byproducts of this breakdown was uh, the October Revolution and the enormous effects globally which it had. Now, uh, this uh, period uh, is over uh, and we find ourselves in another of the at another of the historic moments when we find the existing world system if you like the world economy world civilization working up towards or perhaps in the process of a major restructuring a major change in direction which may not be easy to predict, impossible to predict. What I noticed in, the, in your introduction to the book was a sense of, of uh, historical change destroying the continuity between generations, oh. erasing the past yes. as it progresses, so that, so that what's truly terrible about this century is people can't remember. And it makes a historian's job more, more difficult. It makes a historian's job more important. But there's this continual sense of the tape of the historical past being erased from people's memory by the sheer pace of change. I think it, uh, this applies to the younger generations, post-war generation, or anything else. And I think it happens not so much because of the pace of change, but because of the change of character of society, uh, which uh, concentrates on the individual rather than the individual as part of a community, a society, a continuum between generations and on the now, namely uh, buying things, enjoying things here and now. 
And that's the enemy of historical continuity and historical memory. Yes, because for one thing, you see, the mechanisms in the past, there are always mechanisms by which uh, the young generation is linked with the older generations. Uh, for instance, uh, Marc Bloch, the once, great French historian, the great French historian uh, once pointed out that in actual fact, in agrarian societies, continuity is maintained by jumping generations. Children are brought up by grandparents because parents go out and work in the fields. And so consequently, children immediately get introduced to what grandparents remember of their past and so on in turn. And that's been broken up in our This century. has been broken completely for a variety of reasons. Uh, for one thing, indeed, I mean, the experience of the past is quite often no longer relevant or no longer seems relevant to the younger generation. And consequently, it becomes something different. The only past uh, which people, very young people, uh, really recognize is their own personal past. The rest is something like olden times. I wanted to now shift tack and talk about the ways in which your own life intersects with a history, because I think that this is what makes this such an unusual book, the sense in which your own life is implicated in the story you're telling. <clears throat> I mean, if you begin right at the beginning, you're born in Egypt, your father works for the uh, Post and Telegraph Company. It's a very imperial beginning, in a sense. Your, your own life begins in the British imperial twilight. I mean, is that how you see your, your own beginnings? I've been conscious of, as it were, living in history for a very long time, but that is essentially because at a crucial stage, you know, when I was, whatever it is, a young teenager, I was lucky, yes, lucky enough to live in Berlin just in the last years when Hitler came to power. And if you don't feel that you are part of world history at that time, you never will. So, so you're a very odd case, in fact. You're, a, you're an English Jewish boy growing up in the Berlin in which Hitler comes to power. Yes. So that's where we are. Now, at 14, you do something extraordinary. You join the Communist Party. Now, why? It isn't extraordinary. I can assure you that in 1931, 32, it was not at all extraordinary uh, for somebody to become a communist. Why? Because you can't understand anything about the first half of the 20th century, at least from 1914 until uh, Second World War, right in the middle, without grasping that most people believed the old world was coming to an end. Inevitably. The old world was crashing. We were living in the crashing of an old world. And you had to look for an alternative. It was either a fascist alternative, or it was a socialist alternative, which in, in Germany in 1931, 32 would have meant communist. But Hitler is just about to take power. This is 1933. Is it becoming dangerous to engage in student activity? Uh, obviously, we had, I mean, we knew that this was a major uh, catastrophe. I mean, I can still remember to this day the afternoon when I was walking back from school and saw the headline. Hitler as, uh, you know, Reich Chancellor. Uh, personal danger in the sense of being personally afraid, that's a completely different matter. Whether you are personally afraid or not is a, a private matter. Mm -hmm. But as it were that you know that what is happening is something dramatic and for a long period at least irreversible, that we knew. Is that a moment when you become conscious of Jewishness or had you always been conscious of Jewishness? There's no way in which you could be brought up in Central Europe without being conscious of Jewishness if you were Jew. Even though 
uh, I wasn't that conscious of anti-Semitism because in some ways I was being treated as a foreigner, an English boy rather than things. But there's no way in which you can avoid the consciousness uh, of, of, of being a Jew, which I've always had. And uh, You leave in 1933 for, for England, but you don't leave, in a sense, because of Hitler. No, not because of Hitler. You're not essentially Jewish refugees from Hitler. No, really refugees from the slump, you might say. Right. Do you leave behind Jewish relatives in Austria and Germany? Yes, of course. And what happens to them? Some get out, uh, some get into concentration camps and die. At about this period, 33, 34, the Kulak class is being liquidated in millions of peasants are dying, starved, or being deported by Stalin. 33, 34, we're in the midst of the five-year plan, or the second five-year plan, I can't remember. But in any case, millions of people are dying in the Soviet experiment. If you had known that, would it have made a difference to you at that time? to your commitment to being a communist? This is a sort of academic question to which an answer is simply not possible. Um, I don't actually know that it has any bearing on uh, the history that I've written. If I would give you an a retrospective answer, which is not the answer of a historian in something, I would have said probably not. Why? Because in a period in which, as you might say, mass murder and mass suffering are absolutely universal, the chance of a new world being born in great suffering would still have been worth backing. Now, the point is, looking back as a historian, I would say that it was probably uh, not the sacrifices which were made by the Russian people were probably only marginally worthwhile. The sacrifices were enormous. They were excessive by almost any standard and unnecessarily great. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking back on it now and I'm saying that is because it turns out that the Soviet Union was not the beginning of the World Revolution. Had it been, I'm not sure. After all, do people now say we shouldn't have had World War II because more people died in World War II than died in Stalin's terror? So what that comes down to is saying that had the radiant tomorrow actually been created, the loss of 15, 20 million people might have been justified. Yes. This is exactly what people said about World War I and World War II. Most people I have ended up by saying, we think it was wrong in World War I. Very few people ended up by saying, we think it was wrong in World War II. But isn't there some sense in which the radiant tomorrow can't, in principle, be built at that cost? Because it can't then be a radiant tomorrow. Because human beings have memories, and what they remember is desolation. In the first place, I think, you see, uh, a radiant tomorrow was rhetoric. It was, it was the rhetoric of the people that I believed in, too. That's true. But it was pure rhetoric. We didn't believe in radiant tomorrows. We believed in a world rather than no world. We hoped that that would be a far better world. We hoped that it would be, quote, unquote, a perfect world in which, you know, in, in some of us, when you're young enough, you believe that there wouldn't be any unhappiness. There wouldn't be any unhappiness in love in this new world. But that isn't true, even if rationally one knew that this, this wouldn't be the case. Nevertheless, the real secret of the whole business was, if you believe you are living in a world which is crashing about your ears, your choice is 
a future or no future. Uh, and it was that. If you remember, and I quote it somewhere in my book, uh, the famous uh, phrase by Walter Benjamin about the angel. Huh? The angel of history. The angel of history, you see. That what the angel of history sees as he moves backwards into progress is precisely the ruins of, that are being accumulated by the process of history. So, in a curious way, even though we, uh, as, as, as communists and other socialists, if you like, were committed to an upbeat view of the future, we really, living through the period in which did, we knew we weren't living through a period in which all you have to do is to push the right kind of button uh, and turn the right kind of switch and everything's going to be lovely. I don't think any serious uh, left winger even believed uh, that the Soviet Union, that everything, the Soviet Union is lovely. It was an awful place, even if you underestimated the number of people who were killed uh, and, and, and uh, uh, imprisoned uh, in it. You come to England in 1933. By 1936, you're in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And right through your Cambridge years, and then in the post-war years, you're very actively in the Communist Party. What did it mean to be a party member in those years? Uh, those of us who stayed in and committed ourselves, I suppose the only thing to do is it's a lifetime commitment and a total commitment. It was the most important thing for us because, uh, again, I've got to return to what we said earlier on. You didn't have the option, you see. Uh, Either there was going to be a future or there wasn't going to be a future. And this was the only thing that offered a, an acceptable future. Uh, so when, you say, when you say total commitment, I mean, how total? Uh, if the party told you to do something, it would have priority over everything else. I mean, if, a party, if the party said, you can't be going out with that woman. Yeah. Really? Mm. That far? Mm. It dictated your personal life as well as your political convictions completely. In theory, at any rate. Whether it always did so in practice, we don't know. But in fact, to a surprising extent, I mean, uh, yes, uh, you know, I mean, it would, it would have complete priority. Mm -hmm. See, what I find very difficult to, to square here is your obvious a restless independence of mind with this party belief. I can't see how someone like you could r remain within a kind of organization of military Jesuits. I think if you found you couldn't actually uh, hold still for what you were supposed to, you, you just kept quiet. You dealt with something else. I mean, for instance, I never professionally uh, wrote anything or said anything about uh, the Soviet Union or the Russian Revolution because it was perfectly clear to me that what you were officially supposed to say about it was just not so, or at any rate uh, contained large chunks uh, which were simply not defensible. When did you know that to be the case? Oh, I mean from the moment that uh, uh, they started saying whatever it is that Trotsky had been an agent of the British Intelligence Service going back to 1918, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which was even before the war. Uh, well, if you did that, uh, the option was uh, either you wrote about the Soviet Union, in which case you couldn't be in the Communist Party, or you kept, you kept quiet and wrote about something else. Did you ever go to the Soviet Union in, in this early period, and what impression did it make on you if you did? Uh, I went to the Soviet Union for the first and the only time, really, except for sh relatively short uh, trips, which don't count, in the year after Stalin died, when they were just beginning to open up. It made a very poor impression on me, not so much because you could tell about all these awful things that had happened, 
you could merely see that it was an extraordinarily poor and backward country, but we knew, one knew that after the war and the destruction. It was a country in which one didn't recognize any communists. Meaning? Meaning, we knew what communists were like. And the only thing that one could see in Russia were people who lived in a communist country and made their career in a communist country. Now, of course, this was untypical in the early 50s because uh, the guys had yet to come back from the, from the camps and later on, or from the exile, and later on one came across again, you know, people who were recognizable. But whereas in... What you're saying there is interesting. That is, the people who actually burned with an original faith have been put in prison, in fact. I don't know, but you didn't come across them. Yes. Uh, whereas, for instance, in uh, the uh, people's democracies, quote unquote, uh, you did recognize these people. You may have thought, you know, these have now become bureaucrats or this, that and the other, but you, you could recognize how they worked, how their minds worked. They worked the way we worked, not in Russia. Well, what's it like to be in a church, assuming that communism is a kind of secular religion, when you know, having seen with your own eyes, that the central mystery at the center of the church, that is, the state of the Soviet Union, is rotten. But how do you live with that? The Soviet Union, you see, for us, uh, who, in the West, was not the central mystery. Uh, socialism, communism was a central mystery. The Soviet Union is where it started, and for practical purposes, you absolutely had to work with it because that was, between the wars, that was the only game in town. There was no other kind of socialism. If that had gone, there would be no chance at all. In effect, you couldn't get anywhere without the Soviet Union. And you see, that was true. Without Stalin, without the Red Army, we wouldn't have won the war. A uh, couple of months ago, there was a conference in Italy about uh, Nazi atrocities during the war, the memory of uh, World War II. And there were people there from Russia, too, who regarded the entire subject as merely a conspiracy to stop people talking about the awfulness of Stalinism. And one of the Italians got up and said, you must realize uh, Stalin was terrible for you. For us, it meant liberation. But let, me tell, let, me tell you a, let me tell you a story, Eric, that I grew up with about Claude Coburn, who was in the party. Yes. And they asked Claude Coburn what the experience was of being in the party, and he told the following, admittedly, very sexist joke about a Southern belle in a rape trial who's asked by the judge when, judge, when she, he asked the Southern belle, did the rape actually occur? And the bell says, oh, judge, it was rape, rape, rape all summer long. <laughs> but I mean, wh wasn't being in the party to an intelligent intellectual like you at a certain point, rape, rape all summer long, in the sense that you had 56, the Hungarian invasion, you then had Prague, 68, the Soviet invasion again. You had one constant thing that was just unjustifiable to justify. 56 was the real turning point. This is when the international communist movement went to pieces. Until that time, uh, it didn't. Uh, in fact, it was held together probably by the Cold War, which prolonged actually the existence of the Soviet Union and the existence of the international communist movement. Um, so before that, uh, you had a number of things which were increasingly implausible and not so much the actual terror because we really did not know, nobody knew how many people were killed. They, even now they don't know. Even the, uh, the anti-Stalinist outsiders don't know because the estimates about everything in the Soviet Union are Pure speculation. I mean, they but are you actually seriously telling me that the uh, that the Stalinist crimes are much exaggerated? No, I'm not telling you. I'm simply saying that nobody knows. 
what we say about Stalinist trials so far is depends very largely on uh, the attitude of the people who are uh, making the estimates. For instance, on the gulags, there is a difference. All the estimates are terrible and indefensible because they all run into millions. But the estimates range from between 3 and 4 million to between 13 and 14 million. Mm -hmm. And with a range like this, they are not serious estimates. They aren't even uh, orders of magnitude. All you can say is that whatever actually turns out in the end, it was inhuman, indefensible, and, and there's nothing, there's no way in which you can minimize it. What, what happens in 56 to you? Do you leave the party over the Soviet invasion of Hungary or not? No, we, pr I, we protested, all of us. I protested. The others did too. But I personally didn't leave, but most of the others did. Why didn't you leave? And why didn't you leave so for so long after? It's very different for people who became communists in Berlin between 1931 and 1933. Uh, even though for most of us in this country and elsewhere, the basic historic experience is that of the 1930s, the broad popular front one. This is still the way I think about politics and effectively politically. In fact, uh, the commitment goes earlier. And in a way, I, in the first place, I never wanted to belong to the people who had left and turned against. I don't want to be in that company. I didn't want to be in that company. In the second place, I did not want to betray the people I knew who had actually sacrificed their lives and lost. You see, a lot of people, people like myself, had very easy lives, by and large. But there are others of my friends and comrades who haven't. And, you know, I can show you photographs of people and say, this man uh, was killed in the resistance, this man was killed you know, these were my contemporaries. And uh, I do not wish to buy, I did not wish, by renouncing this past, to diminish the enormous commitment for the good which this movement represented, and I still believe represents. It just so happens that those of us who were communists in the West never had anything much to, uh, shall we say, reproach ourselves with. We fortunately never became governments and were expected to do the things which communists and government in the East were expected to do. We were on the right side. What we did was on the whole on the right side in this country, and very few. All we can say is that when we talked about Russia, which was neither here nor there as far as our <laughs> politics were concerned, we were either fools or liars or naive. But that's a quite a different thing from saying the God failed. In what sense do you still feel there is something left to communism as a project? Because it's not clear to me in the, in the book what you think is left that's viable politically about the communist project. Communist party? No, nothing. Uh, communism as something uh, a state and society organized on the model in which it was in the Soviet Union and on the model of the Soviet Union, no, no future. I believe, as I try to show in the book, that in a sense, this was a peculiar historical freak, if you like, that uh, for understandable reasons, the revolution triumphs 
in a country in which communism could not conceive, or socialism as Marx and other socialists conceived it, could not conceivably have been built. So what is viable? What remains? What remains is, uh, in fact, that uh, if the world is to have a future, it will have to be, as it were, it cannot rely on the spontaneous operations of the capitalist system. It has to uh, rely on, to some extent, uh, human communities taking conscious responsibility for their welfare and their future. Whether this implies something like whether this, that, or all industries are to be run by the government or how the, these seem to me to be second order questions. But that it cannot be left to the simply the free play of uh, the market or some equivalent, that seems to me to be absolutely basic and that, that remains uh, absolutely basic, it seems to me. Um, but that just makes you a good left-wing social democrat. That doesn't make you a communist. That is probably true, uh, that in a sense, uh, becoming a good left-wing social democrat is the way in which Marxism was clearly developing before the Russian Revolution. Marxism didn't actually have the reputation of being essentially a theory of revolution and barricades. It was the anarchists, the anarcho-syndicalists which had this. The idea of the revolution barricades came back into Marxism via October, you see. But, but the, what we come down to at <coughs> the end of it is that you made a commitment when you were 14, which was we either have socialism or we have barbarism, and in a sense you've remained true to that all your life. I hope so. And alas, we haven't got socialism, but we do have an increase in barbarism. What exactly do you mean by barbarism? Uh, I mean, firstly, that in some sense the rules of social behavior, which uh, tend to govern all societies, must govern them if they aren't to disintegrate into some kind of Hobbesian anarchy, uh, are under threat or under disintegration because of the uh, change, uh, changes in society which we seen and through Chogai. But I mean... Uh, which second, changes are producing barbarism within the capitalist world? For one thing, uh, the, um, the growth of big cities and I suppose I would say um, the fact that the mechanisms for keeping these things under control in the past are either weakened or may possibly disappear. Which mechanisms do you mean? The state, for one thing. You yourself, if I may say so, uh, have pointed out uh, that one of the reasons why in Yugoslavia you find that there is this extraordinary, uncontrolled outburst uh, of uh, almost uh, erotic, I think you say, uh, violence, is that these countries had got used over a long period to government and law having the monopoly of legitimate violence. This now disappears. There are no other rules about how to treat violence and what to do. And uh, the result is, indeed, uh, cruelty, atrocity, barbarism. So barbarism means, to use your own phrase, the democratization of violence. That, I think, is one aspect of it. Uh, that's obviously as the aspect which we mostly notice. Uh, but at the same time, it seems to me that barbarism is also much more specifically, the gradual weakening of the standards uh, and uh, aspirations uh, of 18th century rationalism and 18th century environment, uh, enlightenment. Finally, the last sentence of your book, as I recall, says, unless we have a changed society, we'll be going into darkness.
very somber conclusion. And I wondered if you could put some flesh on and bones on that very tenacious dream of a changed society that still obviously drives you and still obviously inspires you. It's difficult to imagine because we are gradually getting used, you see, to living uh, under conditions which in the days of our parents, my parents or grandparents, would have been regarded as intolerable. And so, uh, what is darkness, you see? Uh, everybody thinks a catastrophe is something which happens from one day to the next like a big earthquake or something like this. But what we are not easily getting used to is a slow motion catastrophe, such as we can see happening in large parts of Africa today. It is possible for human life to go on and people for adjusting themselves to living in the sort of conditions in which people have been living for 20 years in Angola and Mozambique, uh, for whatever it is, 10 years or more in Somalia, for five or six years in Liberia and a number of other places. Um, no doubt in some way or other, something like life uh, on the basis of being nasty, brutish and short, can nevertheless become regularized again. And yet, looking at it from where we stand, and looking at it not only from our hopes, but from the experience, after all, living in Liberia or Mozambique, in, even in the early 1970s, or Somalia, was different. Living in Tajikistan was different. It wasn't ideal, it was even bad, but I mean, it was, it, it was better than what there is now. And I think when to say darkness, it means, doesn't mean that we shall all kind of commit suicide. It means we shall get used to living under conditions which should not be tolerated. Yeah.